Hi, everybody. My name is Stevie B. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of the Golden Text Group down here in Hollywood, Florida. It's great to be here with you guys tonight. Thanks so much, Stephen, for having me. Thanks for asking me. And uh, anytime I'm being asked to speak in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a great honor. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I owe so much to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Zoom is uh, a different type of format for, for us. For uh, So I'm going to do the very, very best I can. And I'm excited to be here. I mean, there's there's a hundred and there's like almost 200 people here that I haven't met, uh, which is, you know, which is rare. And uh, you look like a fine looking bunch of uh, alcoholics, recovering alcoholics. And uh, I can see that the program is alive and well working around the world. Praise God. So um, my name is Stevie B and I am a grateful believer, as I said, and um, I'm a believer in the program. I believe in our God. I'm a believer in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe every word in the first 164 pages of the big book of Al and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I believe most of the stories, if not maybe all of them, I, I'm not sure, but I certainly believe everything in the first 164 pages of the big book, and it has proven in my life uh, to change me from the very core of the person that I was uh, to the person that I am today. Um, I'm from Long Island, New York, uh, from which is the, the northeast of the United States. I don't know if, uh, if you know anything about uh, Long Island, New York, or if you know anything about the northeast, uh, but we have built in ego problems from birth. Uh, I'm not sure if it's something that they uh, put in the coffee or could put in the cereal, uh, but I, I thought the entire world centered around New York. I thought the entire world centered around Long Island, New York, which is where I specifically where I'm from. And I definitely had an ego problem uh, and an inferiority complex all at the same time since I was uh, a little baby boy. My mother tells a story, she just told me recently, she said, uh, we knew we were going to have problems with you when you got kicked out of nursery school. And, and I said, Mom, why, why didn't you ever tell me that I got kicked out of nursing school? She said, she said I didn't think that it really mattered uh, because you're such a changed person today. But at four years old, we could already see that there was going to be problems with you. Um, I'm one of two kids. My sister turned out to be great. She's an overachiever. She's perfect in every way. She's got... Uh, 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 to, you know, uh, three kids, a white picket fence. She's a vice president of a company. She still has her communion money. I mean, she's everything is great with my sister. I'm the complete opposite in every way. I, I, I you know, and, I, and I'll fill in a little bit of that as we go along. I'm half Jewish and half Italian, uh, which means I grew up in, a, in a, like a, a very mixed up home. We were praising the Lord on a Sunday and passing the matzah on a Friday. And it was very confusing for a kid. Uh, because uh, my one Jewish side of the family would come in from the city um, and, and I would say something about Jesus. My, my parents were like, Shh, no, 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 this is the wrong side of the family. And, and then, you know, I, I would say something about uh, the Jewish side of the family. On the, so it was very confusing. And I, I want you to know that I, I, I suffered uh, from alcoholism way before I ever took a first, first drink. And I know that because I was restless, irritable and discontent. And it had nothing to do with alcohol. And I know that there's some people on here. I mean, like you have what an incredible meeting, Stephen, that you guys are hosting. Hundreds and hundreds of people are here tonight. And I know that some of the people in here tonight, they may have become alcoholics because they drank uh, consistently uh, over a period of time and then became addicted to alcohol and they may consider themselves alcoholics. That's not my case. Alcohol was the answer to my alcoholism. The moment I took my first drink was the first time I had a moment of relief. I'd been suffering from alcoholism for 14 years before I ever took my first drink. I was 14. I was fighting with kids on the playground. I was lonely. I was miserable. I was maladjusted. And I came from a loving home, two beautiful parents. My dad was a Korean War hero. Um, my mom was a overachiever in every way. She was one of the first women chiropractors in the entire state of New York. She's one of 12 original women chiropractors in the entire state of New York. So I came from a great family. Love was shown in my family. They told me they loved me and I couldn't feel it. They told me I fit in, they wanted me and I didn't believe them. I was always seeking for love in all the wrong places. And one of the things that I did in the beginning uh, before I found alcohol and drugs, I just wanna let you know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real alcoholic but I'm not a pure alcoholic. Now, of course, out of respect from this meeting and just seeing the bow tie that Stephen is wearing, I'm not gonna get into any type of drugs story in my in my story tonight out of respect for alcoholics anonymous but if i say somehow in my story that i rolled myself up in a carpet 
or I was peeping out of a window for three days, obviously it was not because of scotch. So that wouldn't make any sense and, and I wouldn't be authentic. So I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm a real alcoholic. I'm just not a pure alcoholic. I, um, I was uh, nine years old when I found out that I was adopted by my dad. Um, I didn't know that my birth father had died. Um, and uh, my parents, uh, uh, it was their eighth anniversary and I was turning nine. And, um, my, and I said, well, how is that possible? And then they gave me the story that I was adopted by uh, my, my, my dad that I had. He adopted me when I was one. I didn't know that. So it turns out that I really wasn't Jewish um, and, uh, and that I was fully Italian. And that was also an issue. I, I had so many issues. I was like a kid with issues. My last name is Jewish, but now I'm Italian. And I thought I was Jewish like, like a, three weeks earlier, but it turns out I'm Italian. I was like a whole ball of issues. But my main issue is that I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I don't know if anyone can relate to that here, but I just didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. And um, I'm going to give you an example of alcoholism before I ever took my first drink. In my, air, in my area in the Northeast, it's separated by blocks. And on my block, the kids that had the most juice, the most power, they had big brothers. So there was the Mundingers and the Wagamans and the Cohens and the Woolies. They all had big brothers. As a matter of fact, there was three of them. In every family, there was three big brothers. And in my family, I had a little chubby sister. And I didn't have a big brother. And I felt the reason I didn't get any juice and I didn't get any respect in my neighborhood is because I didn't have big brothers. So I always wanted to have a big brother. And, and I also felt part of the problem why I didn't fit along, fit in is because I had no representation at the playground. You know, I was always trying to figure out ways of why am I feeling so restless, irritable? Well, I don't have a big brother. Why am I feeling so restless, irritable, and discontent? Well, because I'm half Jewish, half Italian. Why am I feeling so restless? And I was always putting something on it, not knowing, of course, that I had a, I had a, a, a spiritual malady. So there was a new coach that came to school and the coach looked at the roster and he, and he looked at it and he goes, Boyarski. And I go, yes, coach. He goes, uh, does your brother play for the Pittsburgh Panthers? Now, I'm going to tell you, that's a simple answer if you don't have a brother, number one, or if your brother doesn't play for the Pittsburgh Panthers. It's also a very simple answer. But right there, I knew my entire life was about to change. So he said, does your brother play for the Pittsburgh Panthers? And I said, yes, he does, coach. Yes, he does. Now, now I, came, I was in a big school, like 500 kids just in my class, 2,000 kids in my school. Like, like all my friends looked over at me like, what are you talking about? You don't have a brother that plays for the Pittsburgh Panthers. And you have a, you have a stepbrother that's a plumber from Massachusetts. What are you talking about? I'm like, no, I never told you guys but I have a brother that plays for the Pittsburgh Panthers. And just like the coach said, his name is Jerry Boyarski. And I tell you that story because regular kids, even if they lie, they don't, they don't live the tale. Like I lived that tale. I took that tale. I, I had jerseys. I had my, my last name on a jersey because it was the same last name. I had newspaper clippings. When Jerry Boyarski got drafted into the NFL, it was like the greatest day of my life. Because in my mind, I had told that story for so long, for so many years, that he was actually my brother. Now, as you can see, I had an outright mental defectiveness. When I was 12 years old, my parents weren't, uh, they, there was a tragedy in my family. We had a funeral going on. And also my mother was in the hospital, a very, very serious uh, action she was in. So she's in the hospital and I'm 12 and I have a beautiful little nine-year-old sister and I said, this is my chance to like make, to, to, to get cool on the block. So I went to the toughest kid on my block, the kid I always wanted to hang out with. May I just ask, cause I'm not really getting a lot of feedback. Uh, Steven, can you guys hear me clearly? Just go, yeah? Okay, great, good, thanks. So um, I went up to this kid, Kevin, and I said, would you like to hang out with me? And he said, uh, why? Why would I want to hang out with you? Now, mine is the toughest kid on the block, the coolest kid on the block. It was, why would I want to hang out with you? Now, my father, because he was a Korean War hero that fought on Porkchop Hill, may God rest his soul, he went home to be with the Lord about eight months ago. We had guns in my house. And I said to Kevin, I said, well, we have, I have guns and we can blow stuff up. And he said, uh, yeah, I'll come over. I'll hang out with you. And we started blowing stuff up. And after a while, Kevin got bored and he was going to leave. 
And I, that feeling, that was overwhelming feeling that more important than anything else, no more important than safety, more important than the consequences. I'm not saying at 12, I can really think of the consequences, but I said to Kevin, Kevin, please don't leave. You can shoot at me. I was, ra I was rather that he shoot at me than me be alone in my own skin. And I gave him the gun. He was only 13. It's not that he's responsible. And he shot at me and a one in a million chance. I blew out my right eye. I lost my eye that day. And I tell you that story because that is exactly what happened my entire life. I, would, I was willing to be anything that you wanted me to be, do anything that was crazy, do anything that would get me out of my own skin in order that I didn't have to feel the pain of being who I was. By the time I had my first drink, Manischewitz Jewish table wine, if anybody's Jewish in here, you know what Manischewitz is. It's like the, uh, the gold choice of, of alcoholic wines. And uh, so I had uh, a, a glass of wine when I was 12 or 13. It was like the bomb. You know, now I'm, I'm being in a lot of surgeries because of my eye. So during that year, I was out of school. And um, I don't know if it was what, whatever it was for, but I had a glass of Manischewitz Jewish table wine. And the moment that went down, I was like, wow, this is it right here. This is, this is going to be, this is, this is something that it's going to be, you know, this is going to be a good time. I'm, I'm going to definitely have this for the rest of my life. You know how we say one day at a time now? We just do it one day at a time. Well, I, I had an, I had, I, I, I knew about one day at a time before I, before I ever got an AA because I was, I said to myself, I'm going to drink this stuff one day at a time for the rest of my life. I was already living in another program. The moment I had that was like, wow, instantaneously. And then soon after that, about 16 years old, I found marijuana. Uh, I told you I'm not going to get into drugs, but I just love marijuana. I just think I just thought marijuana was like the bomb and I was never going to not smoke marijuana and I was never going to not drink alcohol. And, and I just thought life was going to be just grand. And I, somehow I skidded into college. And, and uh, when I say skidded is most people get accepted into college. I kind of skid in the back door of the college. And uh, of course I became the president of the fraternity. I'm, I'm, I'm a, 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 a definitely a type of guy that can rise to the occasion in a drinking fraternity. So I became the president of the fraternity. I skidded into grad. I, I, I barely got through school. And then, and then while I was in school, I developed a, a problem with some pretty serious drugs. Because I, I'm, a, I'm a type of guy that if one drink is going to be good, 15 is going to be better. If marijuana is going to be good, well, cocaine is going to be better. Uh, if I'm with Susie, well, I'm probably going to want to be with Patty. If I'm with Patty and we're over here, I'm definitely going to want to be over there at that party. Like I was restless, irritable, and discontent, even when I was drinking. There, there's nothing that's been able to fill this God-sized hole my entire life until I found God. And I found God through Alcoholics Anonymous. Once I found God, then there was a perfect fit. But it, it was a, it, we're a long way away from there. I don't, I'm just cutting to the chase. I'm, I'm giving you the back of the story already. So I'm in college and and uh, like I said, and, and, and I'm not going to get into one more story about drugs, I promise you, but I do need to mention that I did have a cocaine problem, and, um, but, but I didn't have any money, so it really wasn't a problem. I was on a waiter's salary. I was one of those waiters from the Dirty Dancing Resorts where people go for an entire week, and then they tip the waiter at the end for the entire week. They give them a big envelope. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, in the Poconos and the Catskills. I was one of those type of waiters, and so I didn't really have any money for cocaine, uh, so that they really didn't become a problem. And then my uncle, who was a, um, a very famous uh, internist down in South Florida, a medical doctor, a genius, just a genius. He taught himself how to speak Spanish, not Spanish, excuse me. He taught himself how to speak Italian at the same time he was going to school in Italy to become a doctor. He was learning to become a doctor in a foreign language as he was learning the foreign language. That, to me, that's like amazing. I, you know, I struggled in English in America. That, you know, just show you, you know, the, the, I didn't get those genes. So he was like my hero. He drove a Jaguar when nobody had a Jaguar. He had a house on the water when nobody I knew had a house on the water. He was just the coolest. 42 years old, millionaire, respect. And he died on the bottom of a swimming pool uh, one night after having two bottles of uh, fancy champagne 
at a local restaurant down here in South Florida. It turns out that my uncle had alcoholism and uh, we just thought he was eccentric, uh, but he never got to find the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. May God rest his soul, my uncle JJ. And when that happened, since I was the only male heir in the family, um, the problem of me liking cocaine but not having money became a reality because then I had a lot of money. So here I am a senior in college and I inherited my uncle's money. And then you do the math. I'm not going to do any of those stories, but I'm going to tell you, it got bad real fast. And I didn't even know I had any yet because I didn't even know I was an addict. But everything got increasingly bad real fast. I'm, sure, I'm looking at some of you guys, most of you in this page have definitely lived through the 80s. So you remember the 80s. And even if you were uh, only an alcoholic, uh, and I don't mean only an alcoholic, but even if you're a pure alcoholic, and I'm looking at some of you, you guys look like pure alcoholics, some of you guys. You know what was going on in the 80s. You saw the movies. You saw the movie New Jack City. You heard about Scarface. Well, I was involved in all of that. And, 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 it, was, and it got bad real fast, real fast. And I'm like this half Jewish, half Italian kid from Long Island. I didn't know anything from any of this. But all of a sudden, I'm being around machine guns and all this kind of stuff. And life got bad fast. I eventually ran out of money. And I went home and I told my parents. And, uh, you know, back 35 years ago, it wasn't very common, at least where I was from in Long Island, to go to treatment. We didn't know anyone that went to treatment. What, what I mean by drug treatment. We didn't know anybody. Uh, but one of our cousins um, actually went to a place in the middle of Minnesota called Hazelden. And uh, we called them. And uh, my parents said, listen, Stevie's got a drug problem. And uh, what should we do? And he said that they had some success with the program um, called uh, treatment. And um, that if we sent them to way to treatment, then they would send us back a clean, a clean kid. And uh, I was in my senior year of college. I, I was, when I say senior year, I was going to fail out. So it was, it was good. I bowed out. I left uh, with medical uh, leave. And, um, and I went home and my mother put in a VHS tape of a movie called Clean and Sober with Michael Keaton. And she said, you're going to go and you're going to get clean and sober. Watch this tape. And, and they brought me in a six pack and I was watching the movie clean and sober while I was drinking a six pack. Cause we didn't know that alcohol was, a, we had no clue in my family that alcohol was anything that was, I, I mean, I certainly didn't have any clue. I wasn't going to treatment for alcohol. I was drinking while I was watching the movie. I didn't put two and two together. I had a problem with one substance and one substance only. And I was a senior, I was 20 years old or 21 years old. And I wasn't going to give up drinking. That wasn't even on the register. Um, so I was going to go out to this place in Minnesota, just like clean and sober. And I liked it. I liked the movie. I thought it was dating. I'm a dating type of guy. I'm always looking for the next relationship. So it looked like it was going to be fun. Like I like, I'm, I'm a social guy, right? So it looked to me like it was going to be spring break without drinking. So I'm, so my parents like, you're going to, you're going to treatment. I'm like, okay, that seems like a good option. First of all, I'm broke. I just failed out of college. I just got my car robbed. I've been using drugs for like, for like three semesters straight. So they're like, you're going to treatment. And they show me the video. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. That sounds good. And I do like I always do at that time. I dress for the occasion. So what, what I mean by that is I have like guinea tees because I'm Italian from New York. So I dress with like my guinea tees, which is like, which is like, a, uh, you know, like an undershirt. I have five gold chains. I got five bottles of hair gel. You know, all the necessities. I got balloon muscle pants. I got cologne. And I'm going like for a spring bake experience, not knowing where I'm going to, I'm like, I'm supposed to be going like one day at a time sober for the rest of my life. I have no clue what I was getting involved in. I arrived in Minnesota on February 7th, 1990. It was negative 40 degrees outside. Nobody explained to me that in the middle of the United States, it's like the Arctic tundra. I never heard of anything like it. It was like Fargo. I landed with a guinea tea on which is a t-shirt and five gold chains and hair gel. And I'm freezing to death. I had, I had no idea what was, I'm like, what did you send me to? I'm calling my parents. They, they had already joined this program called Naranon, which is like Alanon for like narcotics kids. And, and I'm like, what did you send me out to? It's like the tundra out here. Get me back. They're like, they're like already tough loving me. They're like, you're going to have to figure it out. We didn't cause this. We can't cure it. We can't, they started giving me back lingo. They got me on a plane. The next thing they knew, they were using lingo on me, some absurd program that they had joined behind my back while I was like drinking in the living room, waiting to go to treat. 
So here I am stuck in the middle of the United States. I walk into this treatment center and there I see the 12 aberrations up on the wall. And the first thing it says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. I called the concierge over. I'm like, excuse me, I'm not here for no drinking. I'm here for one substance and one substance only. I'm gonna go back to college next semester. There's no way that I'm gonna not drink and I'm not gonna admit that I'm powerless over alcohol. I didn't even really start my drinking yet. So what kind of nonsense is this? I got a check here for $35,000 from my dad. I'm expecting some good treatment here. And when I and, and in 30 days, I need to go back and finish my life. The guy came over and he's like, listen, son, apparently I wasn't the first New Yorker that ever landed in Minnesota. He goes, listen, son, we're going to take you to a, a meeting hall by the name of 2218. It's the oldest meeting house in Minnesota. I, I guess this was supposed to, I was supposed to have some reverence for this. I didn't even know what a meeting hall was. I didn't care about old, and I certainly didn't care about Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's like, we're going to take you to the oldest AA clubhouse, and you're going to, then you're just going, we're going to love you too. You can love yourself. I'm like, what is this nonsense? You're going to love me too. I'm coming here to get off cocaine. You got to think about alcohol, a big sign up on the wall. I'm not even going to, I'm not even in the same ballpark as you people. So I went to leave. I went to pick up my three piece matching Gucci luggage and leave this treatment center, a bunch of kooky people. But what happened was it was like negative 45 degrees out and there was a snow drift that got in front of the door. It was like the shining and he knew nobody could leave in this weather. I don't know if there's any people from the Midwest here, but it's, it's, Unless you've seen it, unless you've been in it, you can't even comprehend what type of cold this is. I went to school in the Poconos, but the Poconos is like five degrees, three degrees. In Minnesota and South Dakota, you got like negative 45 degrees. That's a whole other planet. You got to be dressed for that. So this is how I came to AA, Stephen. I came in AA because it was too cold outside to leave. I tell people that story and they're like, why do you tell people that story? This is why I tell you the story. It doesn't matter why you're here. You could be wife ordered. You could be court ordered. You could be husband ordered. You could be job ordered. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I was willfully underdressed and it was freezing outside and I had no place to go and it still worked. They told me just stay until spring when it thaws out and then you can go back to where you're from and we'll gladly refund your misery. I'm like, fine, I'll stay here. First of all, I have no clothes to leave. So I, I definitely did not pack correctly for Minnesota. So I'm going to stay until it gets warmer. And that's what happened. I stayed until it got warmer. And then I met a guy by the name of Raymond Myers from New York, also a, a Jewish uh, guy from New York. And um, he became my sponsor. He started taking me around to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the most beautiful thing of the, things of this program, if you're new or just coming back, is, is that they really mean it. They're going to love you until you can love yourself. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you something. I was totally unlovable. You know, I want you to think about a pit bull with my cousin Vinny. I want you to take my cousin Vinny and wrap it in a pit bull. That's what I was. I was like this Italian wise guy, gangster wannabe that had all the answers. And, and these old timers like scooped me up. And, and they loved on me and they took me to meetings. And because I was so blessed to be out in Minnesota, I got to hear this speaker by the name of Clancy I that most of us know. And that was like the first time, may God rest his soul, that was the first time when I heard Clancy that I could actually laugh at myself. I'm like, wow, you know, maybe I know that my life almost ended for, due to drugs, but maybe I don't have to take myself so seriously. Maybe this is actually gonna work out. Maybe this bunch of older people that are obviously crazy, you know, maybe this is actually going to work out. And I, I, I found, a, um, I, I relapsed out there in Minnesota. Uh, I had 18 months of sobriety, but I didn't work any of the steps. I just thought you go to treatment and then, and then you stay sober the rest of your life. I didn't really, I, they didn't talk about relapse. I didn't think relapse was ever going to be part of my situation. I thought once you go through the 30 day process, that's it. You're in, you bought your membership and you're in, you're in for life. I didn't realize there was going to have to be a lot of work and there was going to have to be steps and it was going to be service and there was going to be surrender and there's going to be prayer and then there's going to be meetings and there's going to be commitment and there's going to be a daily routine and there's going to be a meditation, which I didn't really get the whole, it was going to be uh, that serious of a deal. So I kind of did a lot of surface stuff. I did a lot of dating 
And, uh, and I got about 18 months of sobriety. And then I went back to my original. Somebody said to me in Minnesota, they said, I heard you used to have a problem with drugs. And I said, I did, but now I'm in AA. And they said, well, would you like to get high? And I said, yes. That's how much defense I had after the first uh, drug or drink, because I really didn't do the work. I had 18 months, but if, you, if you're new in here, I just want to tell you, you know, you got to have to do the work because if you park a car in the garage or you bring a car that's broken to a mechanic and you park a broken car in the garage for 18 months or two years or three years and you don't do the work and you go to get the car and you go to bring the car out of the garage, it's still broken. So I was really a broken car um, that didn't really do the work. I, um, I eventually got sober again through another treatment center, came down here to South Florida to be with my grandfather, JC, may God rest his soul, what an amazing man. And I called the intergroup uh, AA hotline that night when I got down here to South Florida. And um, I met an amazing man by the name of Myron, who was my sponsor for seven years, may God rest his soul. He just died with 45 years of sobriety. And he took me all around South Florida and showed me AA and showed me the goodness of AA and the people of AA. And it was just great. And for about four years, I was very grateful. I had four years of sobriety and, um, and uh, everything was going good. But once again, I got full of myself. The ego returned. I'm like 30, I'm like 28. And I got big muscles now. And I got a couple cars and, you know, the ego for me, in step six and seven, if I'm not constantly working on giving my defects of character over to God, if I'm not asking him to remove them through my, to remove the shortcomings because of my natural tendency to think I'm really, a, I'm all that in a cup of tea, the, my defects of character will kill me. And I didn't really see that step six and seven was going to be the answer to all my problems. I really didn't see that. I was more like a, a, a step three and 11 type of guy and, and with 12, which was, means I, I believed in God. And I was going to turn a little bit of my life over to God. And I was going to do a lot of 12-step work. And that did keep me clean and sober for seven years. But I got, I got much sicker. So let me, let me get to what happened. I, I married this beautiful woman. We had a big AA wedding. People came in from all around the country, from Minnesota, from New York, California. It was beautiful. And I was all full of alcoholism. And I didn't know. Because I hadn't had a drink for six years. I didn't realize that alcoholism doesn't care if you have six years of sobriety. As a matter of fact, alcoholism is excited that you have six years of sobriety because if you're not working a program, it knows that before long, it's about to get you. And I was in my wedding and I was all about me and, and cigar rollers and ice sculptures and famous singers and all the nonsense, you know, all the big hoopla that I thought I was, all the big shenanigans that I thought I was. And I was, an ego was just taking over just, and you couldn't give me feedback. And of course I drank, but the reason I drank is because I didn't believe I was powerless over alcohol. All the years in AA, was seven and a half years in AA, I didn't think I was powerless over alcohol. I knew I was powerless over drugs, but I never was able to admit to my innermost self that alcohol was a drug. Listen how crazy that is. I, I'm in AA all these years and I'm saying, my name is Stevie B and I'm an alcoholic, but I didn't believe it. I was really thinking like, the only way I can keep my membership is to say I'm an alcoholic, but I'm really not an alcoholic. I'm like a drug addict that happens to like alcohol tonight and likes the big one. The truth of the matter is, if you can't admit that to your innermost self that you're powerless over alcohol, you're going to drink again. And before long, which was seven years later, I drank again. And during those seven years, I did things, excuse me, during that relapse, which was a year and a half, I did things that I'm not going to get into in this story, but it was horrible. All the yets, my beautiful new wife that I just married had to see terrible things. I did terrible things in my community. I was, uh, got arrested. I had a six felony car crash, just, you know, which means I got six felonies in one night, which, you know, for a guy that never had any felonies, six felonies in one night, that's kind of like an overachiever. So everything got really, really bad. And, um, and of course I had to like crawl back into Alcoholics Anonymous and say that you're right. But here's the thing, Steven, the big book says that if you don't think you're an alcoholic, go out and try some controlled drinking. But it doesn't say in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that you may die while you're trying to control drinking. And I came back to AA, but I couldn't stay. I would get through Thursday night and I would drink again. I would get through the next Thursday night and I would drink again. I would maybe get four days and I'd drink again. I had to be beaten into submission. Now, when I say that I'm a recovering alcoholic, I truly believe that I'm a recovering alcoholic. When my innermost self tells me that I can have a glass of wine again today, because it does all the time. If I go to a fancy place, one of you fine looking people take me out to dinner and, 
and bring me to one of these fancy places and they got wine glasses all over the wall and you can get a wine a glass of wine for $45 or one of these things that I always wanted to have. I always wanted to be a fine wine drinker. My whole sobriety, I wanted to be a fine wine drinker. The finest wine that I ever got was a $3 box of rice wine at the Chinese food restaurant right over here on Federal Highway. I never got to ever get to fine wine. Even though I was shooting for fine wine, I never got there. So when my brilliant mind tells me that I can drink fine wine, I got to remember that that's the same brilliant mind that told me to buy stuff from a guy named Julio that made it in a bathtub from chemicals at, at, at uh, Home Depot. I can't ever trust that guy. That guy is me. Inside my mind, there's the good Stevie inside my body. There's the good Steve and the bad Steve. When I get on my knees in the morning and I say to God, please keep me clean and sober and, and give and please take away every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me your strength to go out and do your bidding. When I do that, I now turn my wheel over to good Steve. During the day, if I stay in prayer and meditation, good Steve lives. If I go to a meeting that day, good Steve lives. If I finish out the day in service, good Steve lives. If I finish out the day on my knees, good Steve lives. But don't ever think for me, for me, I don't know if that's happened for you guys, bad Steve is still in there. Bad Steve still comes out like if I'm at the beach and I see someone having um, margaritas and frozen glasses with umbrellas, bad Steve's like, you could do that. You never had a frozen fancy drink on the beach with an umbrella. You went right from Mad Dog 2020 to crack and you missed fancy drinks with an umbrella. You could probably do fancy drinks with an umbrella after 21 years sober, Stevie. And I'm like, okay, you know what? That's why I'm going to go to a meeting tonight because it obviously bad Steve wants to come out. Obviously, I'm not cured of alcoholism. I only have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And obviously, when I'm at the beach, my spiritual condition is a little bit wavering because I'm thinking, wow, that would be nice to have an umbrella drink. So let me just tell you an amazing story about God. I meet my sponsor, Russell. My sponsor, Russell, introduces me to this incredible uh, creator of the universe, the God of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have these great sponsors. I have this sponsor by the name of Jerry Bear, which is this tough Jewish sponsor from Manhattan. And I got this other tough Jewish sponsor by the name of Russell Spatz, who's a believer. And, and, and they're both sponsoring me. And it was, it's incredible. One's doing the steps with me. The other one's beating me up with the big book. And I get love and abuse from both sides. It was just incredible. And they introduced me to the creator of the universe. I had made up a God, a little G God of my misunderstanding. I didn't realize there was a creator of the universe that loved me, that wanted to give me his strength, that the big books points to him for a the whole 164 pages points to a, a, that lack of power was my dilemma. I didn't know lack of power was my dilemma. I thought I was a pretty tough guy. Turns out I have no power apart from God. So they started to show me about this, this incredible power called God. And he's got a first name. I don't have to rename him. I hear people all the time. I choose to call him God. That's good because his name is God. And I started following him and I did a third step prayer and I turned my life and my will over to the care of God and everything was going great. I got about nine years sober. My wife remarries me back. I'm in the big bed. I start a program called JC's Recovery House and Center that Giselle knows about. She spoke there, helped us open up the whole thing. And it's a faith-based recovery house. I always wanted to have a faith-based recovery house. And so everything's going good. My life is on fire and my wife and I go to have a baby. And uh, we can't get pregnant. And we go to in vitro fertilization clinic and we finally get pregnant. And, um, and then we lose the baby. And I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming because now I'm in a part-time ministry and I'm sponsoring guys and I'm taking meetings into places. And I, I really didn't see, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see the baby dying. And I'm crushed. And my wife is crushed. And um, I call a guy by the name of Ernie Richardson, and he says, he says pray to, for the acceptance of God's will. Not that God gives you only what you can handle. That doesn't even make any sense. God doesn't give one person the wife dying, another person the baby dying, and another person only has to have a, a problem with their boat. That's not the way things happen. The world is, is sometimes a very cruel place. But God is going to give you the strength to get through it. That's what people in AA told me. And that night I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and my wife went to a meeting of Al-Anon and we both cried separately across town. And then we tried to have babies after that and we couldn't, we, we, we did surrogate and we couldn't have the baby and we 
We went through an adoption and I got kicked out of the adoption agency because they found out that I was a degenerate from the past. And everything was, was really looking dim. And we have a baby room built in the house. And so we have this baby built in the house. We have a baby room built in the house, but we can't have a baby. And I'm crushed and my wife's crushed. And we're starting to question. And my sponsor, Russell Spatz, he said, uh, his wife, Dickie, she said, don't give up. And my other sponsor, Jerry Bear, said, don't give up. And Alcoholics Anonymous said, don't give up. And the church said, God will give you the desires of your heart. And that's all fine and dandy, but we don't have a baby. And we have a baby room built and we just lost the baby. And our hearts are broken because we're like now in our eight, late 40s. And we get a call. We get a call after we go through this whole adoption process through another agency, through a friend of mine by the name of Happy Bob in the program, introduces us to a woman up in Boca and she signs off on a home study. And that's a whole nother incredible story. That's a whole nother God story. If you ever heard any of my tapes, I talk about this whole God story, how Jewish Mindy came to our house and saw a giant Jesus picture up on our wall. And she looked at giant Jesus and she said, do you think God gave you another chance? And I said, I know he did. So she said, how could I not give you another chance? Another God story. She signed off on the home study, even though I have felony charges and all this. And, and now we get on the long line to get a baby. And a month later, we get a call from the top of the United States, right by Canada, by California. And a mother out of the entire United States picks me and my wife. My wife is Colombian, so she's dark. I'm like a dark skinned guinea from New York. And this white, white, beautiful woman from the top of the United States where they only grow white people picks us to come and adopt her little beautiful baby white boy. And we show up there like Mr. and Mrs. My Cousin Vinny up in the top of the United States with our leather, leather coat and our leather briefcase. And, we, and she says, what would you like to name your son? And we said, we'd like to name him Joshua. And she says, why Joshua? We say, because in the Bible, in Joshua 24, 15, it says, for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And she says, well, I'm not religious. And I said, well, I just want to let you know that means Joshua is never going to see a drink. He's never going to see a drug, God willing. He's going to grow up in a house that's full of God. And we're going to love on him to the best of our ability. And he's going to grow up in a beautiful environment. And two weeks later, we came home with this little super white baby. And there was people from Alcoholics Anonymous on our lawn. And they had signs, welcome home, Joshua. And people in Alcoholics Anonymous helped us raise, because I'm 46 now at the time, and my wife is in her 40s. We don't really know that much about babies, but Alcoholics Anonymous does. Alcoholics Anonymous threw us a baby shower. Alcoholics Anonymous told us how to take care of our baby. People in Alcoholics Anonymous helped us with the diapers. People in Alcoholics Anonymous let us bring our noisy baby into meetings because I'm a guy that goes to seven meetings a week. So what am I going to do with the baby? The baby's got to come to meetings with us. And so we, our baby grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. Our baby grew up with God. Our baby grew up watching me speak around the country about him and talk about this adaption process. He turned, um, wait, wait, let me just tell you about how God puts a chair and then I'll, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Stephen. Let me just tell you how God puts cherries on the Sunday all the time. See, every God story, every God story, God shows off in your God story, but you have to be, you have to be willing to see where he's putting the cherries on top of the Sunday. My, my, I, I keep using the word white and you're probably like, why do you keep using the word white? Because our baby was like whiter than anyone in this area. We come, we're in South Florida. You know, it's like, it's like my wife's Latin, I'm Italian and our baby's like super white. And uh, at nine months, he springs out this beautiful red hair. I wish he'd come up from downstairs, but he's probably doing video games. He sprung out this beautiful red hair. And the reason I show you that, tell you that God puts a cherry on the Sunday because my son looks exactly like my mom. He's got the same color hair as my mom. He's got the same button nose as my mom. He's got the same freckles as my mom. He looks exactly like his grandma. When people see my wife, they do it all the time, by the way. They're like, how did he get the red hair? I don't see it. You know, we go, my mom. And they go, oh, see, God shows off with those little tiny uh, extra cherries on the Sunday just to say, Steve, not only... Uh, do I have plans to prosper you and not harm you? Do, not only um, do I want you to stay sober the rest of your life, but I want you to have a relationship with me. You see, Stephen, I would have settled for 24 hours not using drugs or alcohol. I would have settled for the crouton. You know what I mean by the crouton? I would have settled like on a buffet where you have all your greatest foods. You have cracked crab and you have lobster and you have oysters on the half shell and you have prime rib, you have rack of lamb. But you also have salad and you also have croutons on a buffet. I would have settled for just the crouton. 
But God said, listen, I want to give you more. I, I don't want you to sell for a crouton. Yes, you're going to be sober. You're, you're going to have that. Sober is great, but that's not all you're going to have. You're going to go out and you're going to help people. You're going to be selfless with your time. You're going to make time at three o'clock in the morning sometimes, and you're going to give your money away, and you're going to do things that don't make sense. But this is what you're going to get, Stevie. You're going to get a life beyond your wildest dreams. You're going to get an 11-year-old that you just went to Universal Studios with a couple of days ago. And on Father's Day, which was yes, which was two days ago, which I would have never been a father. I would have been, never had been a father, and I had just lost my father a couple months ago. And on this Father's Day, when I was sitting on rides at Universal Studios with my son, and I said, you want to go in the front row? of this new roller coaster? And he says, yes, daddy. I want to go on the roller coaster with you. I would have never had that. I would have settled for a crouton. I would have settled for 24 hours not drinking. God said, rest in me, clean house, trust me, and I'll give you a life beyond your wildest dreams. Thanks for letting me share.